Arizona State University, Michael Crow. How's everybody doing? So, sadly, here's my role. So there's been a creature living in this box. Yeah, he's still alive. And so I'm here to get you ready for him. And so uh, here's what they decided to do. They decided to bring out a professor to give a nice little academic lecture at 8 o'clock in the morning. So that's why you're here. So those of you in the back, try to stay awake. Here's what I'd like to do. I'd like to talk a little bit about uh, a, a challenge that we have in this conceptualization about how to move forward in terms of reaching the broader community of those of learners that need to be educated, that are going to need to be educated continuously through their life, uh, and, and, and the problems that we have with the structural designs, the designs of educational institutions, the design of instructional institutions, which are different than, than uh, universities, the design of companies and others, such as many of you that are here that are involved in the educational space. And so what I want to walk through is a, is a concept of some things that we need to do and some places that we need to go to make some things happen in terms of what I call designing partnerships for social impact and transformation. The basic assumption here is that we've reached a point in the evolution of our socio-technical system in which our society <clears throat> is embedded where learning will be an essential ingredient of everyone's life for the entirety of their life, not just for a fraction of their life. Intense learning will be essential to everyone's life going forward. Now, that's, most of you will say, well, that's not possible. That's not possible. Let's go back at 500 years in time, 1,000 years in time. The world was completely different. Our society was completely different. We've reached this threshold as a result of technological change, as a result of the speed of change. We've just reached a threshold where nothing will be the same. So let's, let's go forward. So one of the things that's really important, if we think that, for instance, we've got problems, we've got about a quarter of the population not getting through high school, in the United States, we've got half the people that start college not, not finishing. We've got all kinds of problems out there in our system. You've got to go back and look at the design. Herbert Simon's one of my favorite academics. He's a big thinker, Nobel Prize winner. He won a Nobel Prize in economics, although he never studied economics, which is a fantastic thing to be able to do if you're an academic. It just sort of shows, shows those economists that you don't even have to be one to beat them. <laughs> Everyone designs who devises courses of action aimed at changing existing situations into preferred ones. So here's the preferred one. We'd like to work against income disparity. We'd like to work against uh, uh, learning uh, gaps. We'd like to provide for uh, rapid economic growth. We'd like to not have these huge ups and downs that we have <clears throat> in the current cycles of, <clears throat> of the economy. So we got a design. Here's, the, here's the, per, the existing design. It's a linear design. <clears throat> you either uh, go to school, K-12, then head off to your career for the rest of your life, life. your age is on the bottom. You uh, go to uh, K-12, you go to technical school or some kind of uh, vocational training, then you go out to your career, or you go to uh, college, a few people go to college, and then an uh, even fewer number of people go to graduate school, and then you go off to your career, and that's it. That's the traditional system. The sy this system is completely, totally, and utterly inadequate. It is unable to respond, it's not likely to respond, it's not likely to change very easily, it is poorly designed. It was useful for the past, not useful for the future. So what we need to do is to design a universal learning system. We need uh, in that system not only traditional students, people that we think of as traditional students that many of you are focused on here who pursue something like an undergraduate degree, who then pursue that because their life can be empowered, their career can be empowered and so forth. We also need to understand that from that traditional system, here's the results that we have. 36 million people between 25 and 65 started college have no degree whatsoever. I won't walk you through what that means for them in the marketplace, but it means about a 100% reduction from where they could have been in terms of income. Uh, second result, here's their income. That's a design result. So we talk about, how many of you have heard the, about the concerns about income disparity? You've heard concerns about the fact that there's uh, wide social uh, gaps that are occurring. You guys are all up to speed on that, right? Well, here's the result, one of the second results of the present design. Here's the third result for those that are able to continue in their ed education through, through college and attain a bachelor's degree. That's a massive difference. In 1975, that difference between no bachelor's degree and a bachelor's degree was almost not measurable. And today, it's this gap. Here's another result of the present design. 
69% of the people who started college but did not earn a bachelor's degree work for a for-profit company. They're in the workforce. Very difficult once you're in the workforce to move forward. So here's our objective. How do we connect the workforce, which is the American model, as opposed to the government? How do we connect the workforce to lifelong learning opportunities? How do we do this at scale? How do we make education a social imperative to national success? Now, some will say that it is, and here's where the debate goes. We've then assigned the entire assignment to the government. That's not going to work anymore. That's an inadequate design. It's too small. It's too episodic. It's too expensive. So how do you design a new universal learning system? Again, the who. You have traditional students. You have workplace-affiliated learners. You've got workplace-affiliated cohort groups, all kinds of people that are out there. You've got people that are just out on their own, just wandering around, trying to find their way. What do you want? What do you need? You, some people want an undergraduate degree or will need one. Some just need a course. Some need a micro-credential. Some need a graduate degree. Some need other things. The, the point is that different people need different things at different times. And why do you need these things? You need them for these reasons, career adaptation, personal fulfillment, workplace adaptation, or you're actually responding to this rapid, rapid change in the socio-technical system. Well, our system now doesn't work this way. It doesn't work this way at all. So we have an idea that we call universal learning. Pre-K, that's in the family where you're, you're, you're raised and uh, uh, you learn your vocabulary, you learn your basic concepts, your, your basic values. Step one, we call uh, out of that is the milestone is verbally and conceptually empowered learner coming out of that pre-K space. We do need more tools and more energy and more activity related to that. Then K-12, step two, the milestone is a fully prepared learner. Right now we've got 25% of the population not reaching this achievement. We've got probably 35 to 40% of the population either not reaching the, this uh, level of attainment in, in terms of being a fully prepared learner or they've got some gap in their learning that, that they encountered along the way. And then beyond that, you become a lifelong learner. And the point here is that it's not about universities, it's not about college. It's about technical schools, universities, colleges, uh, working inside companies, moving back and forth, going back and forth between the workforce, changing the entire model. Unfortunately, here's our problem. We have a huge complexity at the interface between the university itself and the workplace. The cultures are not the same. The funding mechanisms are not the same. Even the view of what's a credential or a credit uh, or a certificate is different. Clock speeds are different. Universities move on a certain methodical kind of pathway, less influenced by the day-to-day uh, uh, the, the -day transactions of the market, different kinds of stakeholders, different kinds of learning modalities. For this reason, these kinds of things have become so complicated that we haven't figured this out. There's a few programs out there that different uh, universities have put in place. There's a few activities that are happening, but nothing systematic, nothing at scale, given the tens of millions of people working in the workplace who have not been able to attain a higher level of credential or a higher level of certificate. So out there right now, we've got different types of organizations. We have organizations that are focused on information transfer, teaching only institutions. These are sometimes efficient. These are organizations that work on transfer, transferring codified information. They work on creating teaching and learning situations where codified information is transferred. There's a number of these in place, different, different types of them. Uh, a small one like ITT Technical Institute in Boise, or the Full Sail University, which is a little bit bigger, or University of Phoenix, which is a massive organization uh, involving hundreds of thousands of individuals involved in this information transfer process. This part of the, of the knowledge transfer and information transfer enterprise often all gets called university or college, when in fact these organizations, which use some of those names, so that people can understand what they're trying to do, are in fact different. They are taking codified information, moving it into instructional frameworks, and advancing it into other organizations so that it can be properly consumed. Now this chart gives you some sense of higher education. Uh, this is a chart that shows each of the dots on here. We're not going to go through the academic chart. I'm just going to try to show you the, the variation in higher education. This is every single one of the 1,500 or so institutions in the United States that grant bachelor's degrees. The size of the circle 
is the number of bachelor's degrees that they are uh, awarding. Uh, on the right is their uh, number of Pell, on the x-axis at the bottom is the percentage of Pell Grant recipients. And the y-axis is the graduation rate, which you'll see immediately is correlated. The colors are a classification system that we've derived to identify, and we're not going to walk through this, but just to show you every single different color, every single different size, and the spread of the work going on in these bachelor's degree institutions indicate the differentiation within this community. We've organized these into 12 different types of institutions based on how many students they have, how many Pell students they have, uh, the number of students that, uh, 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 basically the scale of the institution and the distribution of socioeconomic uh, work. Now, how would you organize this? How would you move this forward? How would you link these institutions to the private sector? How would you link these institutions to uh, companies and corporations? There's so much variability and so much difference. There's no one way. There's no easy way. There's no way to do these things. So we think that going forward, universities certainly that get involved in dealing at the macro level with universal learning, which some colleges and universities will, will, will be built around certain kinds of building blocks. This green building block is really important. This is different than the information transfer organization. The green building block, think of that as the knowledge core. That's the way in which colleges and universities through their faculty and their libraries and other things that they have continuously move towards the edge of what we know, the edge of what we, stand, of what we understand. That's the, the furthering pursuit of knowledge. That's the thing that colleges and universities do. It's the weird thing that we do that nobody understands why we do it. But it's actually at the core of what we do. It's at the foundation. Academic enterprise, think of that as the on-campus learning environment, teaching and learning immersive systems. The knowledge enterprise itself, the little yellow Lego there, is uh, working to support discovery and research, so think of that as research. The learning enterprise is creating new pedagogical tools. This is where you're reaching out to universal learners, and the partnership enterprise means that's where you're doing something with someone else. So let's take a look at what colleges and universities look like. So you have teaching and scholarship university. This is one, these are one, two, three, four, five clusters of the 12 clusters are made up of these kinds of universities. So these universities have basically no research activity or very limited research activity. They are powered by and draw from the knowledge enterprise, that is they're connected to the living, breathing faculty of academia on a global basis. They have various sizes and scales, as you can see with Cluster A, Beloit College, Bennington College, Gustavus Adolphus College, these are small places. And then very big versions of these, Cluster E, BYU, Idaho, UC Merced, uh, University of Hawaii in uh, West Oahu, uh, institutions like this. this. These classifications, by the way, are based on the data from their performance. Numbers of students, types of students, Pell eligible students, levels of research, amounts of research, and so forth. The point here is, how would you connect any of these kinds of institutions to the broader learning needs, to the broader universal learner objectives? How would you connect these institutions to uh, uh, corporate positioned or company positioned or private sector positioned learners. Here's a second, uh, uh, two additional classifications, moderate scale research university clusters. So red again is the on-campus learning environment, yellow is the research and discovery environment. Uh, and so here you see uh, American University, Colgate, William and Mary, and in cluster G, Boise State, Cal State, Long Beach, Florida Atlantic. This just gives you a sense of the different kinds of institutions. Now one of the things that, that we're also trying to do in all of this is that the present classification system that we have for universities and the present way that people think about colleges and universities is completely distorted. It's a thing that uh, uh, is basically driven by exclusion, it's driven by uh, separateness, it's driven by a range of other kinds of variables. This kind of classification uh, typology, and imagine, keep the Lego thing in your brain here, keep the Legos in, in your mind. The Legos is how do you ultimately connect to the marketplace? How do you ultimately connect to other kinds of institutions? So this is the second category. Now we're getting a little bit more uh, uh, complicated. Uh, Cluster H, University of Arizona, Oregon State, Drexel, um, smaller uh, uh, academic enterprise, lots of research. Now you start adding uh, uh, Cluster I, Harvard University has lots and lots of research, the yellow, just a few students, but uh, Harvard has uh, Harvard X and uh, edX and other kinds of things. That's the blue uh, box. Uh, and you can see other types of things that are evolving. And then cluster J 
are very large institutions with multiple types of connections, multiple types of enterprises, uh, uh, and that's uh, Arizona State, Purdue, University of Washington at Seattle, institutions like this. Now, these are not random classifications. These are data-driven classifications on the actual conduct and behavior and outputs of these schools. Now there's workplace partners. Again, think of Legos. So we haven't built mechanisms, and many of you are a part of, of the kinds of companies that build the Lego connections. So we have retail corporations like uh, uh, Starbucks that uh, we work with at ASU, state governments, uh, technology or manufacturing corporations uh, 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 that, uh, like Adidas that we work with, uh, the Air Force, uh, where we're working with some uh, large projects with the Air Force. The point here is scale, size, difference within these corporations, the different colors. Think about the different things that these corporations are doing. So there's frontline workers, there's executive workers, there's IT shops, there's uh, research shops, there's everything that you can imagine within these kinds of corporations. Now, how do you take those universities and colleges of their various types, unless, of course, you want to build an entirely differentiated at the cost of hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of billions of dollars set of teaching and learning institutions, which we don't want to do, how do you connect these colleges and universities of the various types to these organizations? Well, you have to start thinking about that white Lego box in the middle. Some kind of boundary spanning organization. Some kind of way that you can, without negatively impacting either of the cultures on either side. So the cultures, as I, as I mentioned earlier, are highly differentiated. They're so differentiated that the probability that they can mel meld or blend is near zero. It doesn't work. Some of you might have also noticed that when we didn't build these Lego connecting mechanisms between these kinds of colleges and universities on the left and the kinds of uh, corporate and other kinds of performing organizations in the market on the right, some of the for-profit universities that were built to stand alone haven't been as successful as people had hoped. Certainly, they're investors. So now, how do you do this? So one way to do this is to think about learning system having multiple kinds of configurations, where a major, it could be a small college, it could be a large university, it could be any of the types of institutions that we're talking about, then would build mechanisms and structures and devices linking these organizations together. And the mediating organization, in the middle, in the white Legos, that organization is an organization with a special set of skills, a special set of mechanisms, talent, the ability to understand the two different clock speeds, the, the ability to understand the two different cultures, the ability to work between the cultures and the different clock speeds, the ability to make these things happen in real time, the ability to find and design the special interfaces. And these special interfaces could be people, technology, systems, analytics, uh, all kinds of things. Another way to, uh, to do this would be to have a closely coupled organization of multiple institutions. So in this case, you have the, the uh, private entity on the top, the academic entity on the bottom, and a tightly coupled structure between the two where they're interfacing back and forth. This earlier structure is loosely coupled. This structure is tightly coupled. There's still a separation. There's still a gap. But in this case, they'd be working uh, uh, you know, more, um, in, a, in a more focused kind of way. So learning systems have, again, you, you never know what the scale is. We, we, we talked at ASU to a company not too long ago that has uh, over a million and a half learners in their organized learning environment. And they've asked, how can they take a million and a half learners in their organized learning environment for both their own company and their clients and their product developers and their supply chain who are now focused on teaching and learning environments on the right side of the equation where they can have um, uh, all the technical skills that they're interested in, in transferring. How do they then plug into the university and how do they do that at scale? Or maybe not a university, certainly not a university with millions of learners, but perhaps clusters of universities or clusters of types of colleges. And so the point here is, and it may be something that's you know, obvious. Well, most things are obvious, we just can't do them. This is obvious, but we can't do this yet. And so along the way, at least in our case at uh, ASU, we've been trying to think about, well, what do we do? What do we do? How do we do this? So we have lots of experience in building these kinds of relationships on our own, a very successful relationship with Starbucks, an emerging relationship that's uh, off to a great start with Adidas. We have a very good relationship off to a great start with a company called Uber. And so these things are, these things are going very well. 
But then we realize immediately that back at the ranch, back at the university, well, our skill set is not actually best at designing these white Legos. It's a completely different set of skills. And so what would an effective boundary spanning organization do? That's what we call this. This is a technical term. Again, I apologize for the academic lecture, but this is actually, a, a, in a sense, this is a design question in the theory of designing knowledge enterprises. How do you connect people that are going to need what knowledge enterprises have in real time when those knowledge enterprises, like us, can't interface with these corporations or companies in a way to help the tens of millions of people that are in those organizations working who need access to what we have. And I don't think the answer is going to be to build completely disconnected from the core, the green Lego, completely disconnected from the core, uh, instructional entities that just transfer information. So what do they do? We need to accelerate our understanding of corporate social impact. We need to develop new pathways for learners. We need completely new conceptualizations of employee education and benefit, that is the return on the investment. And how many of you saw the panel yesterday with uh, the CEO of Starbucks and, and others? Were any of you here for that, some of you? Yeah. So I think that what um, Kevin Johnson, the CEO of Starbucks, was talking about was fantastic. He's, they've really decided that Starbucks will produce great products, they'll produce great services, they'll create great places for people to gather. They also want to produce great people. One of their products is great people and that the people that work at Starbucks and stay at Starbucks will be great performers, perform great services for the company, and those that leave will be, will be better prepared for the economy of the future when they leave. He believes, and we believe with him, that that is a social duty, a social responsibility. Labor cannot in the future be considered to be nothing but a personless, heartless, non-human commodity where you just take the person, pay what the market will deliver, and deliver the person back to the market when you no longer need them, no better than they were when they came in. So that's, it's a whole new model. We uh, announced with, um, uh, you'll hear about this later, a new entity. This is what we call In Stride. This is now a, an attempt at building, let me just go back, one of these white things here. And the white box is this intermediary. So we have embarked with the RISE Social Impact Fund to create one of these, move this forward, see how it can connect, see the skill sets that can be put in place, see the teams that can be put in place. Can we actually figure this out? Can we actually figure out how to take the uh, knowledge enterprises of several universities, many universities, many learning institutions, can we bring all of that together and can we do something other than just purvey content? Can we actually be connected in a way where we change the learning outcomes of entire organizations? Now to do that, we need these special skills, skills brought in from the market, capital brought in from the market to be able to build this interface. Now, we think that ultimately in the white Legos, we will need new technologies, new policies, changes in cultural norms. Otherwise, again, back to the first slide, we're not gonna change the design. The design will be unaltered. We won't achieve any difference in outcomes. And 10 years from now, not only will we be talking about, about income disparities, we'll be, talking about, uh, we'll be talking about social instabilities. We'll be talking about deeper gaps between, uh, work, between the wealthy and the non-wealthy. We'll be talking about economic issues that we don't have the workforce that we need. We're already beginning to get senses of that. We'll be talking about people not being able to adapt quickly enough. So this is something we've talked about before, and I really throw this out to all of you that are here, particularly from the investment side or the technology side. These are technologies and organizations. I won't walk you through them. We can send this to everybody. We need these things. We need a technology to support relationships to build organizational affinity. How do you become connected to two institutions? How do you become connected to the company that you're working at and the learning institution that you're working with? We need conversation-based artificial intelligence-driven tutoring. We have little simple things like that, but not much. We need group learning tools. I'm not gonna walk you through all of this, but these are things that we need. There's policies that we need. The federal government is archaic. The state governments are even more archaic. From the states, we need uh, enterprise investment approaches for education. 
No longer are we just going to go to the taxpayers and say we need X numbers of dollars for students. That's not working. That's not the way the model will work if you have to educate everyone. If you're working to educate everyone, it's going to be a multi-sector, multi-level thing. So again, I'm not going to walk through these. We do need, for instance, uh, Pell Grants to be available throughout the year. Pell Grants are now only available in the fall and spring semester. Too bad. Were people clapping? No. <laughs> so there are cultural norms and expectations that we need from employers. Can we work to create a culture around education and learning itself? Can we decommodify labor? Can we begin thinking about labor? Even the term is a little bit disconcerting. Can we start thinking about people, learners? Can we start changing the way that we think about the people that work in organizations? Can where you work also be the place where your life is making progress beyond just the work itself? And you say, well, who should pay for that? OK, well, who should pay for that? Turns out we should all pay for that at all levels, in all ways, not just taxpayers. In society, we need to think about changing the notion in the bottom right there, changing the notion of education being a linear process. I know most people in here are older than 30, some people. I see one or two here, older than 30. So who wishes that you could actually be involved in some kind of customized learning that's delivered to you in this kind of seamless way where you have access to things that you wish you had studied, could have studied, want to study, didn't? How many of you just, if it was available and it was available readily and easily for you, would you, would you want it? Come on. That's it? <laughs> OK, too bad for the rest of you. And so. In the green box in higher education, we need to increase clock speeds of designing and launching courses and learning materials and assets. We need to come up with whole new ways of entrepreneurial mindset thinking, new ways to derive resources and capital, new ways to make these things happen, while at the same time not diminishing the core characteristics of the culture of academia. You do that by building these boundary-spanning organizations. You do this by finding other ways to solve these problems. Now, I can tell you, having been at this for a while at, at our own university, all of this stuff is unbelievably difficult. And for whatever reason, you know, we're, I don't know how shocked we are that we've got people bribing people to get to uh, college these days. How many, of you have been, were, how many of you were surprised by that? Some of you? None of you? Well, I was surprised, and I'm in the business. I was surprised. I was surprised that people would pay $500,000 to have their child admitted to a particular school. One person who's not been named yet, $6.5 million. And so I don't know what that means other than it means that something's wrong with the design. Something's wrong with the design. If, if, if you're learning throughout your entire life, maybe you go to college when you're 18, maybe you go to college when you're 28, maybe you go to college when you're 38, maybe you pick up an extra degree your first degree when you're 40. It's, it's, it's a system that needs some serious uh, rethinking. So it's about design. And remember why I'm here. I'm here just because of this animal here, <laughs> person, I should say. And so uh, what I wanted to do is just sort of get out some design input to you all, get some Lego ideas into your thinking, and then have you start thinking about, well, what are the structural connection points between the colleges, the universities, the companies, uh, the organizations, and others, and how can we build both technologically, practically, culturally, organizationally, and financially these boundary-spanning, connecting organizations that can help us make these kinds of things happen. So thank you.